computer and say, hey, welcome, um, Columbia Basin Geologic Society and Eastern Washington University Geosciences um, are super excited to have our last speaker of the year, um, our special noon hour, um, which we might go to a little bit more in the future. We'll see how this works. Um, but I'm really excited today um, to have our last speaker, which is going to be uh, Joanna Redwine. Um, and as you can see from the, the the participants list, if you've ever been to Humboldt State, there's quite a few Humboldt folks here, because um, that's where Joanne did it, like a world-class, top-notch, <laughs> A++ uh, master's thesis on fluvial lakes, and then has moved out and done wonder, wonder, wonderful things. Um, and I saw a speak, uh, talk very similar to this um, at, a, at a GSA a couple of years ago and thought, hey, let's get Joanne to talk about her trench work. It's, I mean, it shows up on satellite imagery. Um, so. I will just say before we get going, if you want to put comments and questions in the chat, that's probably the best way to do it for now. And then at the end, we can kind of all unmute. Um, for right now, I'd probably just mute uh, if that's cool with you or I'll mute you. I don't mean to be rude. Uh, and then we can hear Joanna in her wonderful presentation and then have a discussion at the very end. Uh, yeah. And if people want to have their cameras on, that's more, I think that's great personally. We're kind of doing this and, and not a webinar um, so we can see people's faces and smiles and and thumbs up and pumping of the fists. So without further ado, the amazing Joanna Redwine to talk about uh, the Gales Creek Falls. Ooh. All right, well, that was a lot of pressure. I hope this is amazing. And um, you saw a talk a couple years ago, some of this might be really familiar. Um, so, so these pictures don't have a lot to do with the talk, but Chad named it the windows into Gales Creek. And so I, I found some good window pictures and um, then I needed a good fault picture. And this cow allegedly fell into a crack related to last week's earthquake in China. So um, it roughly relates. And I thought it'd be interesting to look at while I tell you a little bit about this project. Uh, so I work for the Bureau of Reclamation and um, one of the things that the organization does is try to manage its 200 plus dams in the western U.S. And um, the problem with some of these dams is that they were built prior to the understanding of plate tectonics. And so as an organization, we're still playing catch up a little bit with understanding um, fault-related seismic hazards and, and um, uh, doing studies on the fault and trying to understand how to um, assess any hazards to the infrastructure that we manage. And so this is a uh, paleo seismic and a seismic hazard study. And um, kinds of questions that we look at are, are uh, and ultimately try to answer is, is the fault active? When a fault, when we recognize that there's a fault that may or may not be active that might affect this, um, the seismic hazard or the safety of the dam, we, look, is the fault active? Um, how often does it move? So we want to look at the slip rate or the recurrence interval of the fault. Um, how much will the ground surface move in an earthquake, the amount of displacement? And, and then that leads to what magnitude earthquakes might occur on the fault. And that uh, magnitude is roughly a function of the length of the fault or the width or the depth of the rupture. And then um, that information is mostly collected by the geologist, which is the part I play. And then we give the information to seismologists and geophysicists who then um, model the expected ground motions associated with faults at, at given probabilities. They then give that information to engineers who model the um, infrastructure and make assessments of whether or not um, the dams need to be modified for the new understanding of the seismic hazard. So that's a big picture of where the study fits in and, and, and why we're doing why we're doing this. Um, so Chad led me to believe that this is a group of people who are geologists, um, some bedrock geologists or people who don't do these kinds of studies and a lot of students. So if it turns out I'm talking to people who all do this and you and you um, don't need a little primer, we can blame Chad for this diversion. But um, I wanted to talk just briefly of how we approach these kinds of studies. And so it's not gonna to be too different from other types of geologic studies for the most part, but 
when, so when we're clued into a possible fault that's a, that we need to study, the first thing we do is a, a remote sensing or imagery assessment of um, geomorphology. And we look for features that might indicate active faulting and we do a catalog of them. And so this is, this is just a map showing all different kinds of features we we're looking for. And then you do an assessment as a whole and try to try to understand if these do seem to indicate there might be active faulting or not. And if you think so- Joanna, then <laughs> sorry to interrupt you for a second. Are, sure. we, I, can't see your, I can't see your screen. You Are, can't? Is, I, I see your beautiful image in front of the grassy knoll behind you, but I don't see, I'm not sure if it's just me or if it's- Does anybody else see my screen? I'm seeing it just fine. I want to see her slide. She's put the Gales Creek fault slide with a nice shade and a blue background around. Okay, oh. sorry, it's me. Hey, Bo, if you, you have Bo. two screens, one might be. You, Bo. It's all right. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna assume that most people can see it. Okay. Um, okay, so this is, this is the first step of the project. And so you, you look at imagery and you decide if you have reason to continue forward on the study and you, and you go in the field and you do some reconnaissance. Um, if you think that there's indication the fault might be active, you go back to the office and um, I'm going to show you a series of these paired, um, paired images with uninterpreted LIDAR slope maps on the left and my mapping included on the right. And the, the green lines are where trenches were ultimately put. And uh, the colors are polygons of different geologic units or geomorphic features. And so this is a much different scale. That scale bar on the bottom is 200 meters. And so you go back to the office and you do some detailed mapping. Um, look for more indications of active surface or active fault, faulting and pick sites for detailed studies. Um, and the next thing you do, uh, not always, sometimes there's different approaches, but in this case is um, trench studies. So you excavate trenches across these, um, any fault, things you might think are false when you think you found a location where you can answer the questions of is this fault active and, and try to get information on how often the fault might move. And um, so then we make maps out of the trench walls and you'd make, um, we make photo mosaics from a bazillion photographs and, and make a two scale base map that we end up mapping the trench walls on. And this is just a picture of um, flagging. So the, nec the next part is to we use uh, different colors of, of flagging and nails and, and the, those different color flagging on the trench walls are delineating stratigraphic units. And so we map the stratigraphic units and use the stratigraphy to try to find where there's disruptions and where there might be faulting. Um, we interpret the stratigraphy, which is what the folks on the upper right hand are doing. And um, in this case, there are uh, I'm, the photos on the left are showing you there's different, there's different deposits that are back tilted and these are rough, the black lines are roughly the, the uh, contacts that are, that are tilted. Um, and then we make a map on the, onto the photo mosaics for the ultimate interpretation. And so um, we also make detailed de descriptions of the strat stratigraphy and the soils and uh, the stratigraphic interpretations and in, in our descriptions inform our interpretations of the depositional setting and the soils of the um, time between the deposition of the units or the earthquakes. And so this is a picture of um, soils in one of the trenches. And you can see the different horizons on the blue tarp where it's, um, they change, getting redder, changing different horizons, showing different properties that we can use for estimates of relative time. Um, we also take numerical age samples. So these are tubes pounded in the wall to get samples for um, OSL, which is optical, optically stimulated luminescence samples uh, to get numerical ages of the deposits. And then we have a trench review where we try to bring in as many people as we can uh, locally or far flung if they're interested to come 
give us input and see what they think about our, the, our ongoing science. So it's an, it's an effort to let people know what we're doing and also to get feedback from people who do similar things. And this is where the fun comes in when you go home and you try to put it all together and, and come up with a story. And that's where this project's kind of stalled out, but we're working through it. Um, so bringing this back to the Gales Creek Fault. So now that I know Scott Bennett here, um, I'm really gonna brush over this big, big picture stuff. <laughs> but uh, so um, the Gales Creek Fault is located in Northwestern Oregon. It's about 30 kilometers west, southwest of Portland. And it's been identified as, as a structural feature that it's the interpretation that was formed by um, microblock rotation, clockwise rotation that's related to oblique subduction uh, offshore on the subduction zone. And so at the, the boundaries of these rotating blocks, you have faults that are accommodating the deformation or the movement. And so the Gales Creek Fault was um, recognized as one of the, a, a major fault system uh, by Ray Wells and, and other people. And I'm showing you in, in uh, the box highlighted in yellow, this map that was published last year, and it's a compilation of decades of work and many different authors, and is really an amazing map. And uh, this whole effort really helped inform what we were doing, and, and you'll see that we re relied on this extensively and, and worked with, with Ray a good deal. Um, this yellow box is showing you where I'm gonna zoom in here. And um, the orange box here is showing you the extent of where that detailed mapping is in this area. And so there was some detailed map and then bedrock faults in, in some areas where it's not as mapped in detail. And this is the red lines are just basic lines from the USGS fault and fold database. And they show that the entire fault system maybe as, lo as long as 130 kilometers. And um, there's different segments to this fault system with different names, the Gales Creek, the Newberg and Mount Angel. And now the Gales Creek um, section has, has multiple new names uh, that Ray and others came up with in the last couple of years. Um, and, and the mapping's changed a little bit from this. But the overall point is that this is a large fault system and possibly capable of large earthquakes. Um, there has been some historic seismicity on, these, on this um, southern segment, not the Mount Angel segment. This is a moment tensor from 1993 showing right lateral and, and some transgression uh, on or associated with that earthquake. And the location is where that yellow dot is. And then in 2017, there was another, another um, magnitude four earthquake in a similar place. So there's some information that this fault system would be active. Um, so and another, so Ray and others mapped this fault system as a part of a bedrock mapping effort in the region. And in addition, uh, Rich Blakely and others um, did, we're doing aeromagnetic surveys. And based on the geophysical data they collected, they also saw the, the Gales Creek Fault as a major structural element. And so you, you have multiple lines of evidence showing that this is a, a major feature. One thing that Ray found is that there are these folded easy age rocks that are displaced 12 kilometers. And so it, this, there's this anticline, this, these salmon colored rocks and these brown colored rocks. And um, this black line is showing the total displacement of 12 kilometers of that anticline. And so that's 12 kilometers since the rocks were deposited and then folded. Uh, there's another data point based on this mapping where these 16 million year old Miocene age basalts were, were folded and that fold is also offset about six kilometers. And so there are two data points that both give you a long-term slip rate of about 0.4 millimeters a year. Um, and at this point, it's, you know, it's not clear if that, in what time frame the fault is moving. 
other observations from Ray is, is that uh, the larger streams are displaced or deflected as much as a kilometer and a half. So this stream comes down off, um, off, off from this picture from your left and, and is deflected along two strands of the fault about a kilometer and a half. And so, um, so there was some substantial evidence to suggest that this fault system might be active. And since it was important to some of our structures, um, you know, the, the purpose of our study, as I said, was to determine if it was active. And hmm? I, I thought I heard a question. Okay, so so now I'm switching from the geologic map to to a lidar image background, um, hillshade background, and this is Ray's mapping in yellow. And that is the mapping I added to it. So the red lines are my fault mapping, the black lines are liniments that may or may not be fault related and the orange boxes are showing areas we did detailed work. And um, black line is just showing you, I forget, sorry. <laughs> the distance that we, the, oh, the, there's a trench as far north as this, as this north end of the black line and almost as far south. Um, so, First, I'm going to show you what we could figure out with geomorphology. You can do a lot with it. And so the, some of the observations that we had um, is that through the mapping, we, we recognize there, there are deflections or displacements of streams in a right lateral sense, um, smaller streams than what Ray saw and with less displacement. And so, um, for example, this stream is deflected about a um, 100 meters here and here, and to show you the or my interpreted mapping, I think, there, I think there's a couple of splays of the fault that come through here and, um, and affect this, these active streams. And if I zoom in a little more, I'll show you um, some of the even smaller streams seem to be displaced, displaced about 15 to 20 meters and, and maybe even a landslide. So you can look over on the left-hand side and you can see, um, well, first I'll point out these um, pink polygons are side hill benches that, are, that can be tectonic geomorphic indicators as you are, just, as you are juxtaposing pre-existing hill slopes um, from different positions against one another. And so these are light colored features on the uninterpreted part of the imagery. And so the fault is in a, a few different strands, but here comes one of them. And I don't know if it's displacing this landslide or not, but it might be. But this, this stream looks displaced in a right lateral sense. And so all these are indications that the, um, the fault system continue, is continue, continues to be active. Um, and so side hill benches are common, I already mentioned that. And we also see changes in incision as you cross the fault system. So the, in, in this image on the right, the black lines are the interpreted liniments or faults. Uh, yellow is where we're seeing areas of deposition. And so you're getting areas of deposition uh, across, across the fault in a lot of places or changing from incision from deeply incised to less incised. Um, these are, these are the things we look for. And this is another location. I should have mentioned these index maps are showing you the overall fault mapping, but the, the teal colors are where we are in the fault system. So I've shown you kind of along the length of the whole thing. Um, so in the, we picked this setting for trenches because we had the side hill bench and uphill facing scarp ponding sediment. So we tried to get a trench going through that ponded sediment, hoping we get some deposits that we could in, um, get radiocarbonages for. And we're able to do that. Um, other things we noticed uh, as a whole, this fault just doesn't care about topography. It just cuts right across. This is a big drainage divide. Uh, this river is going this direction. This river is going this direction. And so this is a steeply dipping fault. There are humongous landslides in this part of the world and they're not all young. Some of them are, are associated 
uh, move faster during glacial time, so they're climatically related. Uh, but what we can notice is that there were there are, are preserved liniments across them, and so this suggests that the motion or the create or the the process that created the topographic SARPs is, is useful because they're still being preserved even across landslides. However, um, in a lot of these uh, channels in and around Portland, there are these flat bottom channels that are filled with Missoula flood deposits and, and flood deposits that are younger than that. And the, the traces of the faults uh, do not clearly go through the valley bottom. So it was unclear for a while uh, whether or not the faults were as active as, as the channels, if, if, if they were being buried by the channels and, and um, there weren't earthquakes as often as you might think based on the scarps that were crossing the landscapes. So what could we figure out with the geomorphology? Um, the liniments are fault related, or at least some of them are. They're associated with the mapping of rewells and others, and they likely affect um, are, are likely active faults. They affect active drainages preserved in landslides. This is an easily um, erodible setting with a lot of rainfall. You have a lot of mudstones and siltstones, um, the types of bedrock and, and hill slope deposits that aren't, aren't staying put are being, and so likely active faults. Um, looks like a strike slip fault. You have right or lateral displacements, not only in the bedrock, and, but in streams of different sizes. You have other landforms that indicate strikes of faulting, uphill facing scarp, side hill benches, shutter ridges, ponded sediment. Um, and the surface expression persists in the highly erodible area. Again, an argument for, for youthful faulting. And we have steeply dipping faults, but which you would expect with strikes of faults. So you can do a lot with the geomorphology alone. Um, so on to the paleoseismic investigation, then there have now been a total of 10 trenches excavated across different, different um, fault strands of the system, about 40 kilometers of this system. And so Ray, well, Sean Bemis, Brian Sherrod, and I think others uh, put the first trenches in and, and those are represented in, in green. And from that work, they were able to demonstrate this fault displaces units at least 200,000 years old or so. The, the white dots are the seven trenches that um, my organization excavated. And then the pink dot is from a master's uh, student at Portland State University, Allison Horse. She pan dug it across the fault. It was pretty great. Um, so, so I'll show you what, what we did. And this orange box is where we're going to zoom into. Um, so this is a complicated area where you have these humongous landslides. You have an active valley bottom. Uh, you can see the landslides here, active valley bottom. And, but there was a, a nice um, scarp that crossed this hilltop. We thought we'd try excavating a trench across it and see what we found. And so zoom in on that. And you can see that Google Earth caught our trench open across the fault. Um, I'll show you, this is where we interpret the faults to be and take that line back off. And one thing to point out is up on this ridge top, you have uh, the scar accentuated on one side of the fault and muted on the other, which is another indication of, of right lateral displacement. And um, in that trench, we found a whole series of um, old less deposits and bedrock that were more informative than we thought. What we were after with this trench is to see if the fault had any indication of being useful, and if so, we were gonna try to look in other locations to get a better chronology. But to show you what we found, um, here's the partially interpreted trench, and you can see that the base, basal part of the trench has different colors. Um, those are different bedrock units that are in fault contact with one another. So the whole width of the fault had, the whole width of the trench had faults cutting across it or cutting through it. Um, and on top of the bedrock, but, but there's primary faults that are displacing different bedrock units to where most of the um, displacement was occurring. So overlying the bedrock was a series of um, older less with localized colluvium, colluvium just right at the fault tips. 
And we have OSL ages on those units and they're in felt contact with one another. Um, are, and they range from about 30 to 250,000 years or so. And so this is a long lived process of, of um, faulting bedrock and old less deposits. In terms of young earthquakes, um, we think there are at least two and possibly four earthquakes recorded in this trench. Um, this is the most tenuous one. There's a fracture fill that's about eight, has an OSL age of 8,000 years, may or may not be an event. But um, then there are two colluvial wedges that begin at fault tips and go downhill or down trench. And so these colluvial wedges have localized colluvium at the fault tip and they also create less traps as you change where the, you change the uh, micro topography with the faulting the surface displacement. Um, those actually cover or bury the older fracture fill. And then another earthquake might be recorded from displacement up at the upper end of the trench. And you have this whole, um, you have localized displacement or localized pluvium and, and the less drape that goes over these older colluvial wedges. And maybe you have a more recent event that has just a little bit of displacement up at the top of the trench. And so we have, we have radiocarbon ages and OSL ages for all of those units. Um, and, and so we wanted to see if there was um, possibly some displacement in the valley bottom as well as the uh, hilltop. And so we're, I'm gonna zoom in to where that orange square is here. And one thing to point out um, is that there's a right deflection in the stream. The stream's flowing from left to right through your, um, through your screen. And you know, that's a meandering stream and there's people who have moved this stream all over the place. So we thought that may or may not actually mean something, but it was, it was pretty, extreme. Um, on the right side of the, the screen, I have uh, mapped alluvial fans that are coming out onto the fluvial terraces. The blue are the fluvial terraces and the light pink are lows and the, and the um, dark pink are highs, topographic highs. So I was trying to find some pattern to figure out if there was real evidence for faulting there, there or not. Um, it was hard to see. And this is an aspect map draped over a slope map where the liniments popped out a little more, and that's what the pink lines are here. Um, putting a trench in anywhere is, is expensive and, and time intensive, so we were still unsure if we we're actually going to see any active faults in this floodplain. And so we did some um, geophysics, we did some um, GPR surveys, ground penetrating radar, and that's what these green lines are. And what we we're trying to do is, is cover this whole, you know, um, hopscotch and cover this whole floodplain to make sure um, we didn't miss anywhere. That we couldn't get this black line. And so I guess we could have missed a trace of the fault coming through here. But this is a picture of us trying to gather that data. And um, I'm going to show you one of these GPR lines and notice this number 172 right here. And then again, that's the right bend on the creek. So you can see the reflectors coming along and at 172, there is um, a drop down in the reflectors. And it's black line is just a horizontal line trying to let your eye see that the, the deflectors do drop down about three quarters of a meter. Um, this is what it looks like on the ground. And so it's not, it's not a very screaming feature. Um, to show you another one, notice the star with, with the number 42, which is where we thought the fault was. And here's the number 42. And here what we have are the reflectors, I'll put the black line on here, um, showing either a channel or a sin form. Um, but in, a, in addition to the channel form, you have far field down to the east, apparent vertical displacement. So in two locations, we thought we saw apparent vertical displacement. There's some sort of scarp, topographic scarp on the surface and um, a deflected creek. So 
we thought it was worth oh that's what the second second place looks like on the ground so it's not it's not convincing at all just based on standing in the field so google earth caught this mess on on their videos and um there's reasons why we had so many trenches but here is the right lateral uh, or right deflection of the crease. And here's what these trenches look like. Um, you can see that some of the units are being uh, delineated, some of the stratigraphic units with, with flagging. And um, they weren't that deep because the, the water levels were high. And so um, there's Scott, who's here today, pointing something out to Ralph. He should clean that up a little better. But what these, these trenches had were just a series of flood deposits and they were gently folded. And to help you see the fold, um, this unit goes down to where we think the fault is and then comes back up. So it, it mimics what you saw on the subsurface um, GPR data. And in the far field, it was a down to the east, about a half meter, three quarters of a meter, um, apparent vertical displacement. So in addition, we saw sheared sediment uh, shearing along faults. And this is showing that there is bedding on the, um, in the flood deposits as the hand is showing you the direction of it. And um, across the fault, the bedding was rotated about 90 degrees. So we're seeing there was actual deformation of the deposits. And um, this compilation of Colored lines is showing you different flood deposits of different ages. So we have radiocarbon ages uh, that were as old as about 2.9 thousand years. So nearly 3,000 years of record here and one event. And so, um, and the last one was a less than 600 years and possibly as young as 300 years. So that's what we got out of that trenching effort. And so we drew that line right through. Um, the trenches and where the creek is deflected. So um, now, so we were looking at this area up here. So now I'm gonna come down here um, to where we thought we were gonna have better information and get a better earthquake chronology, uh, at least long-term. And we excavated these two trenches across side hill benches or uphill facing scarves with ponded sediment. And this is just a reminder how important LIDAR is in this area um, because this is what it looked like before we excavated and, and that is after. And so um, these are long trenches because the fault zones are wide and you have to get all the way across them. And in fact, I don't think any of our trenches as wide and long as they were um, actually got completely out of the zone of deformation but we caught the majority of it. And so what this trench showed us is that the, there is um, post-slope colluvium, which is this stuff. Uh, tan units is colluvium. The reddish stuff is, is well-developed soils. This is the, the modern um, A horizons on the slope. And they are in fault contact with the stuff that looks different color. I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, so you have hill slope stuff in hill slope deposits um, in fault contact with folded less and, and, and pond deposits. And so from this, we were able to say that there are multiple vents in the Holocene. And um, this is a picture of inner bedded, uh, well, lesses with soils developed into them that are back tilted in the hill, into the um, hill slope. And so we have OSL ages on, on those older less deposits that are folded and they're from 30 to 125,000. So there's a, a long history of um, fault being recorded in all these trenches. Um, uh, we tried another hilltop trench and uh, it wasn't as successful. We still did get a decent chronology out of it, but I thought it was interesting because it has a really nice superficial expression I mean, across it, it's a wide, it's another wide zone. There's multiple, you can see the liniments, there's multiple pieces of the fault system coming across. Um, and that's what that one looked like before we dug and excavated. And um, we were able to find the fault and come up with a chronology, but it was um, challenging. And so 
I showed you this picture when we were talking about the geomorphology and the side help benches and the displaced streams in the beginning. And uh, we put this trench in to try to catch the side hill bench. Uh, we had ran into some logistical problems on that upper end. So we just barely nicked it. And we got this major topographic change down here. And so that's what this one looks like. Here's the top major topographic change. And you, what it is is these old soils developed into bedrock and really old lesses. And again, it's in fault contact with, um, with these lightish brown tan uh, lust deposits that are reached back into the Pleistocene. And then there are um, younger colluvial deposits that are displaced on top of that. So uh, there, the red lines are just showing where we found what we think were the major faults in this, in this trench. And another uh, example of the wide fault zone we kept running into. And here, so here's the trench log or, or the photo mosaic of the trench where you have the, uh, again, red soils developed into hill slope colluvium and old loss in fault contact with these younger, younger folded loss and, and some ponded deposits. Uh, like there's, we think that is a folded sag pond. Um, so, from all this information, we, we can say that we have evidence from multiple Holocene surface rupturing earthquake along the 40 kilometers or more the fault that's been studied so far. Um, so both the geomorphic and stratigraphic relationships that we saw in the trenches, they agree with, with the long-term uh, um, bedrock displacement that we have primarily a right lateral strike slip fault and there seems to be some vertical component. Um, there seems to be some least local compression with some folding. So what we are doing is using these statistics, the uh, Bayesian statistics in the OxCal program, which allows to put in all our different numerical ages from um, optically stimulated luminescence and radiocarbon, which don't always and certainly didn't match most of the time. But what this does is it allows you to get a probability distribution of uh, when your uh, earthquakes did occur and what your recurrence interval is between them. And in most of these trenches, we were able to come up with um, two to four events we felt fairly confident in, at least two and up to four. And so from that data, uh, we have a, a mean of about 2,500 years of the recurrence interval. And so we're working on that. And um, the last earthquake is fairly recent, might be less than 600, less than 300 years ago. And, and there's, so there's most of those valley bottoms in the region that are, are filled with young flood deposits have probably only seen one surface rupturing event, which is why they're hard to follow through there. And so now I'm back and stuck in this um, office setting where what I'm trying to do now is to, to try to pull together not just three of the trenches, but all, all of the trenches data and do the statistics to try to look at um, segmentation, at least in this section. So what this is, is a line drawing of the whole fault system just generalized. Um, and so you can almost see rays mapping in behind mine. It's, it's, it's these light green lines. And so these different colors are different segments or segment boundaries that we're testing out as possibilities um, in the whole 130 kilometer fault system. And these trenches are actually on, uh, there's two trenches on this one segment, two trenches on this segment, and, one, and between our trench and the Portland State University trench, there's a segment up here that's two trenches. And so we're trying to say, if we can say, look at the, the numerical ages and or fault chronology or earthquake chronology, see what we can say about um, possibilities of segmentation in terms of which is important in terms of modeling for uh, the seismic hazard. Um, you might think that the longer the fault rupture, the greater the magnitude of the earthquake, the higher the hazard, and that can be true, but it al also can be true if you have more segmentation and you have fairly big earthquakes um, more, re more, uh, more often that can actually create a, a higher hazard for um, a piece of in infrastructure. So 
that's what I'm trying to work on now. Um, and that's all I got. So thank you. Does anyone have questions? I was about 10 minutes faster than when I practiced earlier. <laughs> That was great. That was good. Um, yeah. So, if people would like to ask questions, we feel free to just say it. If we, if everybody starts talking at once, we might have people raise their hands. But, but Mark Hempel Haley has a question. I do. Hey, Joanna. That was great. Hey. Thank you. Thanks for showing that. I'm just curious about the the segmentation model. So you have um, what looks like a lot of information on two segments and not a lot of information on a bunch of others and i know so what's your sort of um i know that you guys have limited budgets for things but what's sort of your uh, thoughts of trying to go um suss out information on those other segments to develop this? We're, we're left with having to do remote mapping and make some assumptions and put the data out there and hope other people go study them um just the way our funding is and and the purpose of the study I think we'll get that that area between you know B, C, and D pretty good, pretty well understood. But the rest of it just there's not much there. There there's actually there was a study down on the Mount Angels segment, um, and it was it was written up in a Nehart proposal, and it was a good one. And uh, I but I I think they thought their their results were ambiguous, and I'm. I'm wondering if they'll revisit it now. I think it was Rob Witter and some other folks. Hmm. Yeah, I would so love I'm, to keep going on this, but I think we're just done. So is, is the area between B and D closest to your facilities too? No, um, what we're worried about is right in the middle of all this. Okay. And so, um, you know, part of the problem with, with the area down to the South is that there's the um, Lamet river that's obliterating the evidence so there's not a whole lot of places to look mm -hmm. thank you but I, I just would point out that we had to look really hard <laughs> to find the evidence in those and the um and the fluvial terraces and i don't know if we didn't have a really good reason to to worry about it and look at look for it i don't know that we would have put the trenches in so maybe that will give other people confidence to keep going <laughs> Yeah, years ago we were involved in snipe hunts on the Portland Hills fault, and you know it was it's hard to hard to find anything there. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've seen your paper and your trench logs. It seemed to me like you found it. It was just subtle and stratigraphy wasn't great. Yeah, and it wasn't too different from the kinds of things we saw in our trenches. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to look and see if there's. We had a, yeah, there was a comment from Jason Buck. Yeah, Humboldt, um, nice work. <laughs> so cool to see um, it all come together. Nice. So I guess the, like a question is, uh, as far as like Cascadia earthquakes and things like that, it, did you find the correlation? Doesn't look like it at first, but you would know way more than I. I'm sorry, did I find a correlation with Cascadia? Yeah, I mean the major, no. No, well, no, because the recurrence interval is around 2,500 years. So, I mean, the last event is in a, um, you know, it might be it, the last event we just had, it, it might be as young as 300 years. So you could say, well, maybe that was associated with it. But in general, I would say, no, this thing doesn't move nearly as often. Okay, cool. Scott Bennett has a better question than I just asked. Scott? <laughs> no guarantees. Scott's intimately involved with this. So. I was curious, Joanne, um, you know, when people do off-scale models, uh, paleoseismic trenches, you know, some age data just by necessity has to be thrown out, whether they're too young than you think, than all the other data suggests because of fire turbation or they're too old because of the uh, kind of um, uh, inheritance or kind of reworked you know, there's a lot of reasons why you need to throw things out. And um, I've seen, you know, kind of 
kind of keeping a pulse on trenches all across Western United States, I see people throwing out anywhere from like 20 to 40%. And I've done the same. Um, and that, that feels bad, right? That you're throwing out that much data, but it's kind of this, it's, it's required to basically make a, a model, uh, a, an Oscal model that functions. Um, what kind of uh, rejection rate were you kind of needing to use uh, on this, this giant population of trench work that you had to do? Um, I'm still kind of playing around with that, Scott. I, I mean, our, our problem hasn't been too many errant ages. It's it's more that the there's a consistent offset of OSL and radiocarbon, and and what to believe and 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 how to weight what. And I don't know. I've run into two schools of thought. There's people who say don't throw out any data because then you're biased, and then other people, you know. My my bias is to say, like you said, there's times when you know something's wrong. You know that if you have 300 year radiocarbon charcoal and the soil is well developed, there's certain situations where you just know things can't be right, can't be um, correct. But what I've been mulling over is, so the radiocarbon ages are all younger and they're kind of consistently younger. And so Shannon Mahan's doing the analyses, and she and I have been talking about well, which is um, more accurate. And so one thought I have is, well, the OSL is recording the time of deposition of the, of the sediment, right? And then radiocarbons always come in and afterwards. You deposit the sediment, develop the soil, the plants grow, and then the stuff, the, the material gets incorporated in the soil. So, you know, maybe one's, that's how I look at it. I don't know. I don't know if people would agree with it. Makes sense to me. Um, but in terms of, yeah, I'm, I'm still playing with that. I'm trying to get back into playing with that data. I put this project down for a while and just picked it up. Um, so. Well, it makes me feel any better. I just uh, brought out 35% of uh, radiocarbon results from a recent trench. So, it, and that's what I found to kind of be kind of middle of the road and very typical. Um, even if it's not very satisfying, it's, it's kind of what needed to, to model the earthquake ages, right? So. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah yeah this will be fun the fun part's the field data <laughs> the field work any more questions coming up i think we're starting. i have a comment or a question question joanna if you have a second the sure um so it seems as though your the the slip rates your Holocene slip rates are potentially in the same order of magnitude as the the sixteen million year old anticline derived yeah. slip rates. And do you do you feel good about that, or what do you, what do you think about that in terms of um, the 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 maturity of the fault itself, and does it I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on, on that? Um, you know, the fault pattern of this thing, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get back to the view where I can get to it. But instead, I'm just going to, okay. I mean, it's this crazy anastomosing, anastomosing fault system. It's so wide. Um, and so you said something about maturity. I've wondered about that. I mean, look at that thing. And that, that's just, I mean, and then you add my mapping to it. Well, it really doesn't change the width or anything. It's just a little more complexity. So how mature is this thing? Um, is it still trying to find its, its major strand? And, you know, there's not a whole lot of work done here because it's, the whole thing's buried under, under um, young alluvium or, or giant landslides. Uh, and so I don't really know what to think about this strand, um, but I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a long structure. It's a major structure. Um, I'm not sure how mature it is. I, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, but the, the rate of 0.4, well, that's from the age of the Eocene rocks, but then the Eocene rocks were, that's gotta be a minimum because then they were folded and then they were faulted. And same, same with the age that comes from the folded basalts. 
So it, what Ray was measuring was, was the displacement of the folds, but you only have the age of the rocks to work with. Um, so maybe it's faster. Right, yeah, that's, well, yeah, yeah, I, th I, I, I follow that. The, the peculiarity for me is that it doesn't seem like your rates, the whole scene rates are that much faster, which is, which is the peculiarity of, uh, of, I know, I know that the, obviously the Eocene ages are, are, are limiting, maximum ages for that matter, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if, if, if it should be, I don't know. So it, I'm trying to wrap my head around the way the seismologists are taking my data and they're, so they're taking my recurrent, all I have is recurrence interval. They're taking my recurrence interval data and then we're looking at these segmentation models and then they're um, changing it into activity rates and then into slip rates and slip rate estimates are all over the place from 0.4 to like two and a half. And, and it seems like a, a funny way. Well, I, I guess that's just how you have to go about it. You have to make estimates when you, when you don't have, um, you know, I didn't find good Pierce points to measure displacement on to get the slip rate myself. Um, so, I think there's a wide range of possible slip rates depending on the segmentation. And you know, at first blush, you, you can never say, if you're trying to look at segmentation, you can never say if different segments are rupturing at the same time, because like in the Dixie Valley earthquake, you're not four minutes and 20 seconds between those two large earthquakes, you're never gonna see that in the geologic record. You're never gonna see, you know, hundreds of years or maybe thousands depending on your ability to date. Um, and so you can say if, if from trying to look at the, the chronology from the trenches along the length of the fault, you can say, well, it, you could say it could all have ruptured at once, but it may not have, or if, if, all, the, if all the numerical ages kind of line up and that's what we see. If they hadn't lined up, we would say, Okay, well, it looks like there's segmentation here, but we're left with maybe maybe it could be one rupture or, or maybe it could be multiple. We still don't know. So, but maybe it's big ruptures every 2,500 years and not much in between. I don't know if that makes more sense in terms of cool. thinking of the slip rates. Looks like Fred has his hand up. Fred. Okay. Hi, Fred. Yeah. Huh? Hello. Hi. Yeah. I I I I don't know a lot of about this young geology, but when I look at the the deflection that, that you showed there of, of the the river, it, it looks an up awful lot like one of the curves I, I see is a flattening um, um, from the COVID crisis we've had. And, and I wonder if, if some of this motion is, is caused by biology rather than geology. And, and do, do you think it's related at all to cicada um, episodes that are so uh, spaced out in, in time you can't get good radiocarbon dates on it? Yeah, it's most definitely the cicada 17 year cycle. I think you're right. <laughs> Bud, I think you're supposed to use your own name on that. I know, but that's a good one. Uh oh, uh, you should hear the one. I didn't stand up, and for everybody that's listening, um, this is just a, a, an old crack pot guy, so don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> Hi, Joanna. Hi. Very nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, bud. Oh, is that Chad? Oh, it might even be. Hi, Mark. Good luck up there, guy. Thank it's you. A, it's a whole Humboldt reunion here. Well, I don't see anybody else. So yes, I like everybody. Big hand of applause. Woo! That was great, Joanna. That was a yeah. That's a neat system. 
And I'm super glad you were here and a bunch of humble people and a bunch of Eastern students and other students were able to show up in, in Columbia Basin. I apologize, I may have messed up the URL for this, but we still got over 30 people to show up because Joanna's that great. Um, <laughs> and we'll try to come back again next year. We have no idea what the Columbia Basin will look like. Um, but yeah, if you're in Humboldt or you're in, in Cheney, think about donating to your local geology club or group so that they can uh, go out and get some field work done Ooh. like Joanna did. And uh, thank you very much for showing up. There's no more questions. We'll go on with our day. Chad, this is Stan. Hey, Stan. The, when you sent that out, the top URL that you sent didn't work, but the one that was in finer print down below worked fine. Okay, cool. That's what I, that's what I figured out. That's why I'm here. Yeah, good. Thank you very much, Stan. Yeah. I have that little Zoom app thing on my, yeah, it's just a long story. But that was awesome, Joanna. And this is recorded, so if folks missed it, we can always um, pop it on the YouTube channel, as long as Joanna's okay with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah excellent work with, with just, uh, such subtle work. You'd think you'd be in Australia. <laughs> well, thank you all. Thanks, Chad, for inviting me and for saying all the nice things that was hard to live up to. <laughs> oh, you did a wonderful job. All right. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you. Thanks, all. <laughs>